All right. All right, everybody, good evening. Um, what I'd like to do, you get it on the screen, is to start in light of what's going on right now, a uh, couple of Prakima of Tilim. I put it on the screen. I'll do two on this one and one share on the road on the next screen. Um, feel free to say it along. Feel free to um, read Hebrew or English. This should be for Hatzlacha, for all Kohot Habitachon, for all of our, our uh, security services, forces, and protection from whatever's coming our way. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, the, the uh, one of the lines in here is I've said multiple times today. I'll point it out as we get to it. Anatzeach mizmor le David, yancha Adonai biyom tzara, yisagev Hashem al rei Yaakov, yishlach ezecha mikodesh, umitzion yisadeka, yizkor kol min chotecha, yolatacha yedash nesela, yiten lecha chilvavecha, v'chol atzatcha yimale, niranana bishuatecha uveshem eloheinu nidgol, Yemale Adonai kol mishalotecha. Ata yadati ki hoshia Adonai mashicho, yaneu mishme kodsho, vigvrot yesha yemino. Ela varechev, veela basusim. These yamach shamamim, they come with chariots, and they come with horses, and they come with missiles. Vanachnu b'shem Adonai Eloheinu naskir. Hema kau benafalu, vanachnu kamnu vanitodad. Adonai Oshia Hamela Yanenu Yom Koreinu. Okay, you're going to say it. we come with beepers. And beepers. <laughs> That's correct. Or we come with beepers. They come and with bril all those. And brilliance. And brilliance. Amen. Yeah. Shila Malot Esa Enai El Heharim Meayin Yavo Ezri. Ezri Meim Adonai Ose Shamayim Ba'aretz. Ali Ten Lamok Raglecha. Ayanun Shomrecha, Ine lo Yanun velo Yishan, Shomer Yisrael. Adonai Shomrecha, Adonai Tzidachal Yad Yiminecha. Yomam Hashemesh lo Yakeka, Vireach Valayla. Adonai Yishmocha Mikorra, Yishmor et Nafshecha. Adonai Yishmor Tzet Chavorecha, Miata Viad Olam. It was rather, um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, there's a word, my mind escapes me right now, that tonight's topic is going to be, where I mentioned briefly in the last class that we had, uh, when we're talking about the Crusades, about the three communities of spire worms and and uh, um, in Mag in Mag Magenza. Um, and there, the pogrom in 1096, which became known, well, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, and here we are sitting, you know, a thousand years later, almost literally just a little bit le less and you have people again they're saying they want to wipe us out there they did here they want to they won't or hashem but uh so let me start with this just a little bit of review what we talked about in the last class was before we can get to rashi and the, the balatosafot and rabbi Tom, his grandson the rajbam and all these Personnel is like we did in the time of the Golden Age of Spain. We were, and before we can look at the what we call the Iron Age of Ashkenazi Jewry, because of the fact that the iron meaning the sword, uh, and that's not my term. I've, I've come across it a few times in the research. Um, I said we wanted to, we needed to look at this time period globally. What was going on in the world, in the Jewish world, and what was happening, Christian, Jew, and, and Muslim because it's all being interconnected here. And we talked about the first crusade, the second crusade, the third crusade. We talked about where they went to, um, but we're going to backtrack to the beginning of uh, the first crusade, 1096. And even though I mentioned real briefly last time, I want to do a little bit more in depth tonight, uh, having to do with these communities, Mainz, Worms, and Speyer, okay, which we're going to talk about now. Take it off the screen, Shaker. We don't need that for a little while still. Um, depending on the time allotment, we'll determine um, certain things I'd like to get done tonight. One is to talk a little bit of history of what actually happened there. Again, I know I gave briefly, but this will be a little bit more expanded. But in addition to that, what is the, again, one of the things I keep trying to bring home when it comes to history, this history class is 
How does it affect us today? Okay, there were some terrible things that happened back then, but what does it affect us in our day-to-day -day life? So we're going to see two things, uh, hopefully still tonight, uh, when we get to them. So the first crusade, which is in 1096, technically, for some reason, this stuck in my head, even from high school. It was called in 1095, but it actually was put into practice in 1096. Um, and it, it set up a series of pogroms for the Jews that became known eventually as Gzerot Tatnu. Tatnu is, is Taf Taf Nun Vav, which is the Hebrew year 4586, which corresponded to the year 1096. It also became known as Churban Shum, Shin Vav Men, which it stood for Shvire, Vermaiza, which is worms, and Mayens, which is Magensa. Those three communities, which were decimated, which, by the way, I've said before, is a misuse of a word in English because it means cut by 10, even though colloquially it means to be destroyed. Um, and these persecutions were actually the, the persecutions and the, the pogroms and everything that happened, for the most part, <laughs> were perpetrated by peasants from France and Germany attacking the Jewish communities. Um, you'll remember one of the things we said that the original goal of the Crusaders which in Hebrew is tzalbanim, from the word slav or cross. The tzalbanim or the crusaders, the goal was to re, was to redeem the Holy Land, i.e. Israel, from Muslims. And to But they kind of felt like, wait a minute, we got some bad guys in our own backyard. So that's why they go after the Jews. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. There is a uh, an American historian whose his, his forte is medieval, the medieval times. His name is David Nirenberg. I read a little bit of the stuff online, and he said, I, I got a quote from him I put here in my notes. He says, regarding the events of the ten, of 1096, and this is known in English, this part of the, 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 the uh, Europe is called the Rhineland. He says as follows, uh, the events of 1096 in the Rhineland occupy a significant place in modern Jewish history and are often presented as the first instance of anti-Semitism that would henceforth never be got, forgotten when whose climax was the Holocaust. His, his theory, his thesis is that yes, there, there was anti-Semitic activity before him, but this is like the first time it coalesced into a, a, uh, a project, so to speak, that began at that point. And the, the, it led eventually, if he says he, he does, I assume his, his papers and his book, which I did not read, he follows a trail that leads eventually to the Holocaust which is also why when we eventually get to the Holocaust that way down the road, you will see that some of the things that happen, Spire, Vermeiza, Magens, and other pogroms over the centuries, that the methodologies that are used in these places were used by the Nazis, the Machshemon. So the similar ideas that carry on through history, unfortunately. So anyways, let's go back to the beginning of it. So the preaching of the First Crusade, um, as I said, it, it inspires this, anti-Jewish Semitism and anti-Jewish violence in France and in Germany, um, Jews were perceived just as much an enemy as the Muslims, but in some cases, even more so. The classic historical reason given at that point is they're responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. They, that they're the ones that, by the way, they, the Catholic Church, if you don't know, they, they gave us a patrol. They said, oh, we're off the hook. It wasn't our fault. That was not that many years ago, but at this point in history, we're still the the, the uh, killers of Jesus. Um, so there's two things that really ends up making the Jews a major target of the Christians on their way to the Holy Land. Number one, their belief that Jews killed their 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 Messiah, and number two is that they were more available. They didn't have to travel far. The Jews were literally in their backyard. Parenthetically, I don't remember. I don't think I thought of this. I've heard this someone say, "What if we had not?" killed or what if jesus wasn't killed what what did that would have done to their entire religion it's all based on the fact that he came back it's the second coming bye, 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 bye. he's the messiah i don't know shoulda woulda coulda who knows anyways so the one of the the so the among the um motivations jews killed jesus they're more available and we talked about last time also the money aspect that the the the, the peasants and even those who are above the level of peasants needed the money. And by killing off the Jews, number one, they got the money of the Jews. Number two, if the Jews owed them, if they owed money to the Jews, easy way out. 
debt canceled. There's no one to collect. And the and the at this time period of history, the Jews are fairly wealthy in this part of the world. Um, why do the Crusaders have to go into debt? Where, where, what was the reason? So you think about it. It's you're talking about tens of thousands of people who are going to go marching from Europe to the Middle East. They need clothes, food, ammunition, spears, swords, weapons, equipment. They need all kinds of stuff. In order to do that, they have to fund it. Now, let's roll the tape back a little bit. Let's go back to Lahavdil. Let's go back to Sefer Ezra. Beginning of Sefer Ezra, we know that um, Sefer Ezra Nehemia, the Jews are going to do what's called Shivat Zion. Shivat Zion is the return to Zion. For those of you who were in the class when we learned it a couple of years back or less, actually, um, the whole idea that there's Hatzarat Koresh, Koresh gives the permission for the Jews to return, a small amount return, and those who don't go back to Israel, their job was to fund the return to Israel. So this travel doesn't come cheap. And they raised a lot of money, gold, silver, and copper, and other things. And now, the Havdil, this is what's happening here, is that the Crusaders, the Christians, are needing to go and buy weapons and everything else. And by doing so, they are going to debt. And they need the money to pay for it. So I don't know if you're aware of, but there, I know for sure in Russia this happened. It may have been by others also, but in Russia during the during communist times of Russia, when a, a a person was executed for treason or for whatever the reason was that they made up that they executed somebody, and they sent a bill to the family for the bullets, so that they funded the. But the, the, in other words, their victims funded their killing. So in a sense, the same thing's happening here. The Crusaders go into debt, and the Jews pay for that debt by the, with their lives, or sometimes not their lives, but just their money. Um, they also, like I say, were indebted to money lenders. And they rationalized the killing of the Jews because they looked at it as a form of their Christian mission. That was their job. They said, wow, how can you have something like that? How can that ever be? You're talking about intelligent people. History repeated itself on that line multiple, multiple times. After all, the Quran, we talked about this already when we were learning Islam. The Quran talks about there's two aspects in the Quran. One where they're, it, that Muhammad is very complimentary to the Jews, and then when he's very much against the Jews, because in the meantime, it turns out Jews don't want to join him. So then he tells the tree that, you know, the time will come, and the Jews are going to hide behind you, and they're going to say, hey, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come kill him. So there's all, that's their goal. I mean, that's that's the, that's what they want to do. Um, tonight's a good example. That's what they want to do. Why does Iran want to send missiles? Because. Before this, before 1096, it's not like there was no killing of Jews. It's a, it's been a sport for the, the non-Jewish world for many centuries. Uh, in the city of Metz, the city of Limoges, um, and I have down here in 888 and in 992, again, these are cities where Christians went in before this is 100 years, 200 years before the first crusaders, in some cases 300 years before, just because uh, in the city of Treve, T-R-E-V-E-S, Treve, uh, in 1066, 30 years before the uh, the First Crusade, um, it said that they were all these attacks, and this is the quote from this, this historian, were viewed in the traditional terms of governmental outlawry rather than unbridled popular attacks. The passions aroused in the Christian populace by Urban II, he was the Pope, the call for the First Crusade moved persecution of Jews into a new chapter in history, where the previous constants no longer were held. So it wasn't just like haphazard. They were just outlaws. They were just killing Jews for sport. It became a mission. It took on a new flavor, which is also why this author, this historian, was saying that it's like the beginning of real anti-Semitism. You no, know, if if somebody wants to, to plunder just to kill, just to get stuff, that's one thing. It doesn't mean he hates the person. He just wants their stuff. But when there's a, 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 a not just a reason but there's a mission and it's backed up with a religion and there's religious fervor behind it. Here's what Godfrey. Now, again, I don't know. I guess I must've been such a nerd, but for some reason, when I was learning this in high school, it's still, or maybe it's college. It really stuck in my mind. The name Godfrey de Bion, who was the leader of the probably, you know, we say, you know, you hear the name Hitler, you, 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 sh you shiver you, or not shiver, but you, you know what you feel in your bones. You hear the name Nasrallah Yamach Shemo. Uh, who's visiting Hitler right now, 
You hear the, all, all these names, like they were the modern day Hitlers. So Gottfried Bion, who was, he was like, okay, he was a guy who called for um, this, um, the work of going against the Jews. But listen to what he said. He, the Gottfried Bion swore, quote, to, well, he didn't say it in English, to go on this journey, meaning to the Holy Land, only after avenging the blood of the crucified one by shedding Jewish blood and completely eradicating any trace of those bearing the name Jew, thus assuaging his own burning wrath. Meaning, kill the Jew because he killed Jesus. And you're, not, and, and you're talking about the leaders of the church. You're talking about the leaders of the time and, and, and extremely important people. And they're the ones who are saying, do it. We saw last time that the that the, the Pope promised eternal life and automatic Ganeden to anybody who fell in battle. But lest you think that everybody was bad and all the leaders were against were for this, there were some decent people. There was a man who was known as em, uh, Emperor Henry the Fourth. Um, that there was a, a Jewish leader in the city of Mayence whose name was Clonimus ben Meshulam. And he went to this em the emperor and told him what the plan was. And the emperor issued an edict prohibiting the attacking of Jews. Um, and Godfrey de Bouillon said, oh, we really never intended to kill the Jews. Wink, wink. But unfortunately, communities of Mainz and Cologne and others um, fell. Uh, they were they were almost destroyed completely. We'll see in a little bit as far as numbers. The first outbreak of violence uh, happens in France. And I want to read to you again. Tonight, I did more like research. It's kind of trying to get a picture of historical content of what was happening from the perspective of those who write the history. Um, that there's an anonymous author who wrote the following. There first arose the officers, nobles, and common people who were in the land of France who took counsel together and plotted to make clear, clear the way to go toward Jerusalem, meaning let's get the Jews out of the way so now we can have a clear path to Jerusalem. At the time, the Jewish communities in France heard about these things. Trembling seized them. They wrote letters and sent messages, messengers to all the communities around the river, river Rhine to the effect that they should fast and seek mercy from him who dwells on high, that he might save them from their hands. When the letter reached the holy ones of the land of Rhine, namely the men of renown, in Mainz, they responded to the brethren of France as follows, quote, the communities have decreed a fast. We have done that which was ours to do. May the Lord save us and may he save you from all sorrow and oppression which might come upon you. We are in great fear. The Jews, religious or not religious, when things get tough, we'll turn to Hashem. And we, and we see that in this time because again, you know, we get this picture from art school that in World War II, all the people who went to the gas chambers were all, you know, had payas and religious and, and we're wearing shaitals and we're saying Tehillim on the way into the gas chamber. Not the truth. It's not true. It's fake. It's fake history. Same thing is true here. When you have Jews that were murdered in, in, in Shum, in those three communities and beyond, there were religious people and there were non religious people. Yet they declared a fast and the community fasted with them. Um, they did have a what was called the People's Crusade <clears throat> that have arrived in this area. They ran out of provisions. In order to restock, restock, they instead of killing the Jews, they decided to make use of them two ways. Number one, plunder their food and their pantries and their properties to help get them further along. And at the same time, they felt, here's your choice. You can live on one condition. Convert, convert, or die, which, by the way, becomes the what Islam is going to do for centuries, Christians do for centuries. Um, when we get to um, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, we'll also understand that there was something called the auto de fe, where they had to show faith, and either you, you become a Christian and, and accept it, or you're, you're going to literally, literally be burned at the stake. Um, which led to what were, became originally known as the um, Marano Jews, which became a really a wrong term to use because it means pigs in Spanish, Marano, uh, and became modern day called conversos. 
the hidden Jews, the ones who converted, but 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 who were still maintaining their Judaism. It's amazing, amazing. I heard one converso speak years ago in Chicago. She was just so interesting to hear the history, but I don't want to get out of myself. So let's come back. But not all crusaders who ran out of supplies, like I say, resorted to murder. Uh, there was one man named Peter the Hermit. Why was he a hermit? I don't know. Um, but he used extortion. He carried a letter with him um, from the Jews of France to different communities. He would take it around and it said, look, we're urging you to give provisions to this man, Peter. They were so terrified at Peter's appearance. Evidently, he was a very um, scary individual that as soon as they came to the gate of the city, they were giving him all the supplies they needed. Um, something just went out of my head. I was going to say there's something similar now. Um, letters. No, something similar. This is what I wasn't thinking, but let's go back again to the time when when Ezra and Nehemiah, the time of Shivat Zion, returning to Zion, they carried with them letters from Koresh, from Cyrus, to be given to people who were tax collectors and others to allow them free passage and also to help them in their quest to get to the Holy Land. So it's interesting how, you know, everyone's trying to get to the Holy Land for different reasons. Ours are the good ones, of course, uh, and needing the money and needing the funding and how in each case they were using similar tactics. Um, some some Jews actually were subjected to involuntary baptism, uh, such as in the community of Regensburg. Uh, there was a crusading mob that went into the community, and they forced them into the Danube River, river and they performed a mass baptism on them. As far as the Christians were concerned, the Jews were now baptized. Um, after the crusaders left the community, the Jews reverted back to practicing Judaism. Um, in 1096, um, again, the, these crusaders headed off towards these communities, spire worms and, and, and mines. Interestingly enough, the hierarchy of the church condemned the persecution of the Jews. And it was the parish priests. If you don't know much about the Christian church, the Catholic church, that's good. But basically, there's the uh, there's a major hierarchy when it comes to the church. Pope obviously at the top, the cardinals and the bishops and the parish priests, and it works its way down into the altar boys, I guess. However, all the different levels. But so the lower level on the organizational chart, so to speak, um, were very vocal uh, and uh, actually encouraging the mob to to do stuff against the Jews. Um, there was a man named Hugo. From the city, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's, it's probably, but it's spelled Flav, Flavigny. I'm sure it's, it's probably Flavigny. Um, he says like this, how were the religious appeals they were ignored by the mob? Quote, it certainly seems amazing that on a single day in many different places, moved in unison by a violent inspiration, such massacres should have taken place despite their widespread disapproval and their condemnation as contrary to religion. But we know that they could not have been avoided since they occurred in the face of excommunication imposed by numerous clergymen and a threat of punishment on the part of many princes. Meaning, he said, it's amazing how many people were massacred what, in spite of the fact that the hierarchy of the church was saying was not okay, but they had no choice because they were told they don't go to war, they don't kill, they're going to be excommunicated, there's going to be all kind of punishment by the next level down. Uh, so it was a bit of chaos. The mobs evidently did not fear retribution because the local courts, you know, imagine for a moment you're in the city. These weren't like backwater towns. You're not talking about Podunk, Iowa. They were regular cities and they had courts, court systems. So in a regular society, when there is a attack, there's, there's a retribution. There's, there's consequences in a court of law. They had nothing to be afraid of. There was nothing they knew that they weren't to be prosecuted. They had no worries at all. Uh, the pleas of the clergy to have things stop went unanswered. Uh, and um, it just didn't end, end, end very well for the Jews. One of the largest of the Crusades, again, of this time, of Tatnu, 10, of 1096 uh, of the Common Era, 
was one was one that was led by a count named Emiko, E M I C H O. Um, he went with not one, not eight, but ten thousand men, women, and children, and went through the Rhine Valley towards uh, the river towards the Danube to go get himself some Jews. Now, why am I emphasizing men, women, and children? Again, nothing changes in history when it comes to people coming against the Jews. You've all seen videos of Hamas who have their little kids in summer camp as opposed to teaching them the Quran, they teach them how to kill Jews. Um, but the Holy Roman Empire Emperor Henry IV uh, ordered the Jews to be protected when he heard about Emiko's intentions. Um, didn't do much good, though. Jews were killed in Metz. They were killed in Spire. In Spire, they were given um, some um, shelter. They were protected by some, and specifically by John, who was the bishop. And the Bishop of Worms also tried to protect and shelter the Jews. Proceed the, and we saw this last class, the Crusaders actually broke into the palace where they were being held, the Episcopal Palace, which is the home of the bishops, and killed the Jews right there inside the where they were being protected. At least 800 Jews were massacred in Worms, <coughs> and they refused to be baptized as Christians. Um, even though there were some who tried to prevent this from happening, uh, the massacre happened, and many among the Christian business class tried to help. Um, but they had to abandon ships, so to speak, when the Crusaders continued to arrive for greater numbers, greater numbers, greater numbers. And the bishop who was trying to protect them, he himself fled the city. Mainz was the city that had the most amount of, of dead of Jews that were killed, was 1,100 Jews. And uh, kind of was the spark, according to this historian, and also even just, you don't need him to tell you, just look at history after that, it was a spark that really lit one of the major flames of, of, of Jew hatred, anti-Semitism, and the uh, whole idea <clears throat> of killing Jews. Which leads me to, and I'm glad I do have the time, to two more points that are directly connected to these events. <clears throat> if I mentioned this following thing in a prior class, it was only tangentially. So I want to mention a little bit more now. I'll actually do a screen share first. Here we go. Okay. Here? okay. I'm not going to read the whole thing. This is a tefillah called Avarachamim, which is recited in the Ashkenazi world before Musaf on most Shabbatot of the year. There are certain ones it's not said on the special Shabbatot. It's not said on Rosh Chodesh. It's not said on, on others. But there was a time period <clears throat> when it was only recited a couple times a year. It became part of the liturgy of Ashkenazi Jewry to say this before, like I say, before Musaf on Shabbat, and it is a it was written anonymously. It's gone through some different iterations over the last few centuries. But, oh. oh, we're getting an alert. Hold on, extreme. Okay, we're going in for shelter. Class dismissed. I don't hear a silence.